Okay, so would you like an introduction to give me an introduction or should I just begin? Uh, I think you should uh, begin, it will be a lot better. Okay, your English is a lot better than you think it is. It, you're fine, but I'll start anyway. So mostly everyone knows me as a science fiction fan and as a science fiction writer. And my big thing this weekend that one of my books is 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 in the best novel listing for the Aureolus Award. So I really am a science fiction writer. I'm not just claiming it. I sometimes think I pretend these things, but I also have a PhD in medieval history. I started off as a choreographer, so a specialist in how we interpret the narrative of history. Um, but that soon turned into ethno history. So what makes the culture people live in. It's like anthropology, time is an important dynamic and you don't just observe, you observe yourself observing. We're, we're strange people historians, but it fits in very well with the science fiction world because a lot of the time when you LARP, for example, one of the fun things of the game, of the play, of play and seeing, oh, this is what I'm doing. So I get a lot of interest from other science fiction fans in my, my medieval stuff. And the one that comes up most often is food. I'm not giving you my regular speech because you're a quite specific audience. I have finally integrated Polish medieval food into my general talk about the Middle Ages. So I will not leave Poland out. However, most of the high-level scholarship on medieval food focuses on England and France. And since I'm really an expert on England and France, anyway, those, that, those, are, my re those are the regions I did my doctorate in. It means... Um, how to put it? It means it's really hard to move out of that region. Think of Americans who are the centre of the world according to themselves and in many ways until recently, for 30 years, have been the centre of the world. It's really hard for them to look outside their own country because you're surrounded and Poland has always been surrounded by other countries. For an Australian, this is really hard to understand. You do have borders with people on the other side. You don't wave at dolphins or, or, or swim on your borders. Um, it means that you're always, always aware of other people, of other cultures. This is really interesting historically. It means you borrow a lot of food ways. That's why I can talk about medieval Polish cuisine to a certain extent, because you do borrowing. It's very cool. Um, you are now my go-to country for understanding how food ways respond to crises and political changes. And I probably should talk to some of you about what happened in the 80s and whether the changes in Poland with the opening up, closing of the Iron Curtain and all the rest of it changed what, what food you had access to or whether um, communist Poland food-wise was similar to who you are now. So all this relates to the Middle Ages. Um, I have the book about Polish food ways in the Middle Ages and I analyse it for documentation purposes so Jakub, I'm your, your, what you're saying so I can talk about that and it actually is related to your history in the 60s and in the 80s you've got this amazing connected thing which Australia has the opposite of we are a country that's also a continent and we have this is really important there's some stuff I can only ever know theoretically uh, I visit a place because we don't have the same wildlife as you. Rye doesn't grow here unless you plant it from outside. Our, our foodways were completely different to European foodways until Europeans like me came and brought Europe with us. 
so we've only got limited amounts of the types of, of ingredients that you use and that comes into medieval food a lot because the Middle Ages was the time of colonization. It was a time when our countries were made and our cultures were formed. It's very exciting. So um, the best way to approach, yes, that's the book, the book you're looking at. I will talk about it more later, but that's that's the book I, that, that's critical, the, the 60s and 80s thing I was talking about. Um, think of medieval foodways not as a a thing you can know absolutely and easily because it really is hard to find sources for it. There's some stuff we know well, there's some stuff we will never know at all. But from a science fictional and fantasy point of view, we have a huge advantage in understanding them, an enormous one. To understand medieval food, it's the same as building a world. Craft, whether it's role play, whether it's whatever sort of thing you're building a world for, whether you're Raymond Feist or building it for a fantasy series and, and, and gaming, whatever sort of world you build, the processes you use are going to be essential to understand medieval food because we don't, you have to ask questions to the regular, you don't have enough information. If you've got a book that tells you everything, the book, you ask the questions of the book and it answers them. Where you don't have straightforward information, you've got to say, well, what questions do I need to ask? The questions that you have inside you may not be answerable. So think of it as world building. Um, first of all, decide on what date you want the food. The Middle Ages was a thousand, a thousand years long. In fact, in Poland, it, you could say it was 1,100 years long because Poland adds an extra 100 years sometimes. Italy takes 200 years away. The Middle Ages are variable. So decide what day Middle Ages, food in the Middle Ages is going to be significantly different, 1,100 to 1,400, say. Think of the place. London is not the same as Krakow. Think of the environment. What sort of wildlife is there? What sort of plants are there? So when you're thinking place, you're thinking what things grow there. Medieval food ways. I fell in love with the thought that you could still eat auroch in Central Europe in the Middle Ages. It could not in England. It was completely extinct. Wolves were nearly extinct in England. I don't think you ate wolves in Central Europe in the Middle Ages. I probably didn't go there. You've got quite different plants in the northern part of Poland to anywhere in England, and a lot of them are edible. I don't know if they're eaten now, but a lot of people talking about Central Europe and food waste there from the major state. And the peasants starved on these rancid plants. And I was thinking, no, they weren't rancid plants. They were perfectly normal, well edible things that didn't become part of the elite food ways. And so people judge them rather than assessing them. So we don't know at the moment. The English-speaking world doesn't know at the moment how good they are. There are a lot of people in Poland who probably have got the ex I know they have the expertise. I just don't know who they are. And they're the ones who can tell you which ones to look for references in different data sources. You need to look at the season. It's the weather. You need to look at cooking facilities. Ovens... Ovens haven't changed in an awful long time, but they also changed in the late 18th, early 19th century. How can they do both at once? Two different types of ovens. So the bread ovens that you still see in southern Italy were the standard ovens for baking in Poland, in England, in Germany, in Italy, all over Europe in the Middle Ages. You warm up the oven with bracken and stuff and make it super hot. Cook your things like pastries, then hot, quick cooking. Cook them first, then put roasts in, then put, no, you don't put your roast meats in there. Um, 
you can, but you people didn't. You put pies, you put bread, you put everything that needs baking that doesn't spill everywhere because they're not that easy to clean, which is why I was misthinking about the meat. So what it doesn't it's not what's it's possible to cook in there, it's what, what's sensible to cook in there. And that's that's just the nature that so that you think about that. The other of them is the iron oven, and that was the great invention of the late eighteenth, early nineteenth century. And that that meant that people could cook in their own household with temperature control. We had I've cooked I've actually cooked on oven where you put briquettes in so coal and you you work out the temperature yourself and you get a sense by by feeling by practice of how long to how much more coal to put in to get to this heat how long it lasts it's a skill but it meant the private households had super advanced cooking capacity of a different kind and gradually the bread ovens got phased out because you could do it as well more easily there um what else religious and cultural needs are part of your world building food ways so lent what's eaten and what's and the politics my example for politics is is a really i love cheerful examples you've probably worked this out already spain 1492 lost 30 percent of its cuisine 30 percent because one of the things it did and this wasn't through getting rid of its jewish population it was through the Jewish population that it, that convert, it wanted all its Jews to convert and it killed or expelled all the Jews who wouldn't. But it tested the conversion by asking what people ate. So they had to change their eating habits if they wanted to stay alive. The neighbours watched to see if the women ate salad on Saturday afternoons because Saturday afternoons was a Jewish culture thing not a Catholic culture thing. Um, so Spain lost 30% of its food weight by um, associating food with religion, with religious practice and belief. So books. My next thing is if you've got all these questions, if you're building it up as world building, I'm sorry I closed my eyes, but I think it's a really unholy practice. Um, the easiest place to start, this doesn't mean you have to go and buy the book, but it is the easiest place to start because we wrote it for fandom and for fiction writers and for anybody who wants to build and understand a world of the Middle Ages, um, is the Middle Ages Unlocked. There's just one chapter on food and you're getting some of it tonight because that chapter was my chapter. And then Katrin got all her German food historian friends to check it and they said, oh, she knows her stuff. I was very chuffed. So I can say if you want a, a general introduction, it's not a bad one, even though I wrote it. Um, and don't tell anybody, but I won't tell anybody if you copy the chapter from somewhere. It's income and it's good to have income, but it's also very expensive if you then have to buy a you that people here have to buy every single book that people tell you. Life is complicated. So it's English food. Some of it does not apply to other European food, but I went in how the different cooking equipment, how the different um, food stuffs work together so you can see how a medieval food system operates. And that's the easiest way of getting a, an overview. And then you can factor in the local customs and the local foods and, and, and produce and trade fairs and things from whatever area you want to actually look at. Then the next, so find a general introduction. I've given you a suggestion of one, but there must be thousands around. I know that within groups of like the SCA, they have their own and they can be very, very good or they can be very, very bad. Choose the good ones. Choose the good ones. Be picky. But not all good introductions to medieval food are done by historians. Some are done by people who are really, really good at thinking and for whom it's their passion and they're just doing it as a hobby, but they still do it really well. 
So just, just them. Then you need an apprenticeship stage, and this is where um, Miko and I, if I can have the picture of the bowl, the picture of the bowl is, is what you need to see. You need to actually cook because there's a significant difference in the way medieval people cooked and the way we people, we people speak English. We can cook on our modern, using our modern ovens and things. So the easy, so if you have a look at that bowl, the contents of it, there is a modern, I cooked something Polish, and so it's a, a classic Polish medieval peasant food, one of the very few we actually know about. Um, and it's it has a it has a modern equivalent. So I'm not going to tell you what it is because you should be able to look at it technically and say I know what to call that. It's made of millet, salt, water, and butter. That's all. And yes, the real reason I'm not going to tell you what it is is because I do not want to mispronounce an actual Polish word. So the, there are there are two cookbooks that I recommend for the apprenticeship. There are lots of books by medieval scholars, by all sorts of people that have medieval food turn into modern recipes. But there are only two that I would recommend that you start with. One we have a picture of, and it's called Plain Delight, P-L-E-Y-N-D-E-L-I-T. The Plain Delight is a modern pronunciation. It's, it's, of the, the best of the groups of scholars who are partly Toronto based years ago who said we have to I'm just watching the right picture we have it's got two books in it but not those two um, and and it's just the the very the very best of the the practical cookbooks it's just very very sensible and it's got original recipes and translations of them so it gives you a sense of how you can work with actual actual recipes and translate them so not dependent on scholars translating you can say aha i know what this means and the other book i couldn't find my copy of um so there's plain delight and there's the original mediterranean by barbara santich which i think might be out of print and i can't find my, co my copy cooking from them is the best possible way of getting a sense of medieval cooking. Not all books with recipes are equal for that. This one, for example, the food and drink in medieval Poland, I, the recipes are lovely, but they're not actually very authentic. They were part of a, a process that the researchers were going through to try to work out what the food could be. So they're very interpretive. So they're great as interpretive recipes they're not good as apprenticeship recipes. What that book was useful for is to how to interpret a local cuisine. So that's the very best book in English about Polish food. It is the best scholarship in English. It was first written in 1963, and it's still the best scholarship in English on Polish cuisine. And I did a web check to see what had happened since, and no, there is nothing you can get that would be better than that. And I can't speak to things outside English. I wish I could. So when you're looking at interpreting medieval food, there are things you need to be aware of. We carry cultural baggage. We carry all our own pictures with us. Um, the, this book, yes, this book is a good example of that. And this is where I'll get into 63 and 83. It was first written in 1963. It was published in Poland. It was incredibly breakthrough. It changed everything. It had reached the English-speaking world at that stage. It would have changed medieval cuisine. It was amazing scholarship. But because of the politics of that time, it was confined to Poland. We didn't hear about it. Well, I was too much to hear it for that reason, but... It didn't change the rest of the world because most of the scholars, French was the, the language for international stuff in that area at that time, and English took over s soon after. Um, so 63, Poland almost changed the world. 
in the 80s, the guy who is credited as the co-writer, but who was really mostly the writer of the English version, um, Plain White, thank you. That's, so that's the cookbook, I, the cheap cookbook. So I've got both editions. I like the first edition better, but um, the second edition is the one you can actually buy. I like the first edition better because it's got one of my favourite recipes of all time in. There's no difference in quality between the two. Um, so back to the Polish one, what happened in the 80s was it was a really weird thing. So it's full of cultural baggage. The book was published in English because it was taken out, it, it was smuggled out under solidarity posts. Under solidarity posters were all the illustrations. And I, until I discovered that, I didn't realise how part of my family is very communist, part of my family is very right wing. So my, my nephew is currently the guy who, who is in charge of the presidential honour guard in America. He's very, very right wing and very military. My first cousin and was until she retired, pre, um, editor of the communist newspaper in Australia. I didn't realise that in other countries these things were dangerous because for me it's all in the family. So, so the history of, of the study of Polish medieval food shows the amount of, of baggage we all carry. For me, I don't see the risks until someone explains them that this couldn't cross this border at this stage because it was dangerous, because lives are at stake. The scholarship is a thing of actual physical risk. Um, but I could understand the... I'm not sure that anybody outside Australia understands the, the way one family can have such a weird range of people in it. And we're, we're all still best friends. We're, we're close. So, so this isn't the only cultural baggage. The other cultural baggage is 1980s what was happening with the rewriting of the book was because i am an historiographer first and foremost i look into what people put into what they write what people were writing into that book was really cool it wasn't just it was the translator and it was the the adapter guy the guy who took the original scholarship and added recipes and made it and it appropriate for the English-speaking world, they were both trying to define Poland in a time of change. So a lot of the decisions made about what constituted medieval cuisine related to the need to define Polish culture. So all sorts of minority groups were left out, mentioned in passing as, and yes, these people ate, but it wasn't. The implication is that it wasn't food and gefilte fish is my favorite example from the book i always find the lurid examples gefilte fish they actually say in the book that it was appropriated from polish culture even though they couldn't find any recipe for the appropriation they were well pretty certain of it that's to me a real need to own things a real great deal of self-doubt which coming on the 60s thing of this amazing breakthrough and this amazing cultural sensitivity is is pretty important because this is a book that presents the middle ages of Poland to the world and you can't read it without knowing that baggage because if you read it without knowing that baggage you misinterpret it. So that's not the only, so other things you can misinterpret, things that people misinterpret in general are not specific to a particular book. Plates, plates. There were plates in the Middle Ages. There were pictures in the Middle Ages. The relationship between them is understood for some cultures and not for others. And everybody says, but in the Middle Ages, people must have eaten on bread trenches. All food must have gone to charity. Not quite. It depends, actual practice dependent on where you were and when you were. A lot of people used plates. Cleanliness, 
the assumption that the Errol Flynn Middle Ages is the only Middle Ages. I need to re-watch Errol Flynn, that reminds me. Um, and that no one was actually clean. There's a really good way of finding out if a particular culture has strong values of cleanliness. You look at their art. So medieval art for Poland, for France, for Germany, for England, for, every, for all the, the, the Spanish realms, everywhere I've seen medieval art for, for have tablecloths. Some of them have napkins. All of them have hand washing devices. So, and a lot of mentions of manners in all sorts of documents. For example, if you have a, a romantic story, a nice medieval romance, they're going to talk about manners, and those manners are going to include cleanliness and table manners. And from the late 13th, no, 14th century, we actually have etiquette guides, which for English are in. Furnival's The Baby's Book, and anything I mentioned, mentioned, isn't a picture for, ask me about some other time because these are all books I know. So, cleanliness and manners are quite common in the Middle Ages, but not quite common in modern interpretations of the Middle Ages. And the big thing was, was health. Health was incredibly important in medieval food in Western Europe. I can't see why it wouldn't be elsewhere. But the, the Polish medieval interpretation assumes that all Poles were overeating carbohydrates because they didn't have enough food. I didn't know how much nutrition or malnutrition there is in a diet unless you measure people. There's been a lot of recent archaeological work for England that has demonstrated really clearly that people in the Middle Ages ate balanced diets on the whole. The people who didn't were not the peasants, according to the, looks, the, the examination of skeletons. They were the monks there were, who it was estimated from looking at the problems they had with their knees and obesity that they were eating 6,000 calories a day. So they were rich and they were gorging themselves, it, which, which makes a lot more sense than having a whole society starving to death. Famine then meant complete starvation. It meant a lot, it meant loss of the farmed crops in England. People had wild harvesting to make up for those farmed crops. Not, ne not a lot of people died I don't, we don't know how many people died of famine. We do know that many fewer died than people used to assume. So I'm, the scholarship in England is fairly advanced on this. Other countries are also fairly advanced. And as this information gets pulled, we'll know more about how healthy people were from their food and how well they ate. We know for England that the Viking period, which is a totally bad description of it, is actually the early Middle Ages were almost our height on average from surviving skeletons. Ages itself, a little bit shorter, but not a great deal. 19th century London, six inches shorter. Hang on, you're a metric country, six inches. 15 centimetres. 12 centimetres. It's after midnight, I can't count. 12 centimetres shorter. So the problem was not in the Middle Ages with diet. It was with the Industrial Revolution and the people who were doing all the factory work and, and who were immired in, in, in poverty and could not afford food and didn't have anywhere at home to cook food. So the 19th century was shocking and we're all, we've all grown tall since then. The Middle Ages in England very prosperous and people ate well but we assume that they didn't we assume that if they had they were so poor that if they had rotting meat they would put spices on it first of all if you have something really expensive would you put it on rotting meat second of all people people have been not that stupid at various times but a whole civilization is not that stupid because if they are that stupid they end up survive it's a civilization so 
I have a zombie ancestry theory. So when people tell me that people in the Middle Ages put put these spices on their meat to to hide the favor, totally totally deathly, I assume that their their parents did that. Their ancestors did that. I was thinking of the French parent thing. Um, their ancestors did that, and that means they're descended from zom they're descended from zombie people who. Who, who came in the undead who ate the rotting meat my ancestor on the other hand wouldn't be so stupid well thank you michelai for the the, the the six inches thing i've occasionally i remember that I, that there's chat we'll have proper chat afterwards i promise because there are questions you want to ask and, and 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 stuff you want to talk about we'll get to that so if you want to know more about the zombie ancestry theory i gave it to someone in one of my novels and that's the log 1305 it's my time travel novel i gave my historian in it my my zombie ancestry theory because she needed it what types of cookery were there i'm going through notes here that's when i change the subject and my hands go everywhere that's I have to go to a new page. Types of cookery, social role matters. So, for example, if you're in a noble or royal household, there's a lot of etiquette and that puts a lot of pressure on the cookery. The cook have to have a certain range of food. You have to have stuff that will tempt the appetite in the first course, stuff that will fill you up in the second, and stuff that will give you tummy ache, stuff that will settle your digestion down in the third. In aristocratic households, a lot of the food was determined in a good household, in a clever household, everybody healthy, and so they could show off their amazing generosity. In Western Europe, generosity, this was a... a a Gallic thing. This was to do with the, the, what you call, not the pre-Roman. All the people who lived in Western Europe um, before Italy did all the stuff. Pre, but also after that. So there's a whole deep, profound culture, and I'm trying to think of it, the terms, and I have lost them all. Um, there was a whole deep culture that is Germanic, and in the Germanic culture. The, the generosity was part of getting social dominance. And this is why I'm not making assumptions about it for Poland, because you're not a Germanic culture country. But as f bits of you are. Okay, so those bits of you um, wouldn't have because of, Germ because of when people migrated. So in the Middle Ages, um, the Germanic origin countries, the ones with the deep Germanic culture, had food generosity as part of the showing how special you are so you might call someone from a lower table to your high table and give them some of your food you richard the richard the richard the third's coronation so we're talking 1482 um there were actually whole different we've got detailed records for that um, so lots of good stuff we know from it there were different sets of food so that everybody ate amazingly well. But the people near Richard, the most important people, had swans and porpoises. And so, yes, I have a recipe to cook a porpoise. If anybody gets a porpoise, I'll give you the recipe and you can try it for me. I'm, I, don't, I live inland. There are no porpoises in Canberra. So, so manners include gaining social advantage. And you know how some people gain social advantage by standing taller or, or, or making themselves look more important. In the Middle Ages, in Germanic cultures, which included England but did not include Ireland, that food generosity was part of it. It was critical to it. And since they were the culturally dominant group in about the 11th to the 14th centuries, that extended, and this is where Poland got it because of your, your, your Angevin rulers. 
wherever these cultures extended to, so the Angevin Empire, for example, then that set of manners and that range of food extended. And because the nobles were saying, I have to have amazingly varied food to show how rich I am and to show how generous I am and to prove I'm a worthy and good person, they did other things as well, but the food is amazingly important. Um, it means that trade routes were opened up, different ingredients came into play, food ways changed. And this is one of the biggest reasons why there was a difference between aristocratic and peasant food. It wasn't because the peasants, peasants were vile and horrible. It was because they lived a quite different culture. So basically, the more history you know, the more you can interpret food ways. So when you're choosing your place and time, choose something and, and, and look up the history. However, having said that, there are some things that people have in common. And I should stop talking soon because I've talked a lot. For example, half, 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 I'm having trouble with words to that today. Yesterday was fine, today is difficult. Cooking on open hearths, so where you've got a fireplace, is actually common in a lot of Europe. It's in Germany, things are a bit different places in the villages because of the way houses were heated. And technically, this should also apply to Poland. And absolutely, this should apply to Finland. All the places where you have bitter winters, you, you learn closed ovens much earlier. In practice, I don't know if anybody's looked at medieval Poland to see if there's what the relationship between keeping places warm enough so that people can winter and cooking is. I think we know a lot about cooking in Poland and it's virtually the same as, as Germany, no, not Germany, England or France. But I suspect that might be because the scholarship is so strong on England or France. Now, what is open hearth cookery? It's where you have a fireplace and you have some ironwork. So you've got frames to put things on. You might have a, what's called a Dutch oven now, which is a pot that you put dough in and it, you put the lid on and it bakes the bread for you. So it's the way you cook bread in an open half. You might have a big pot that hangs that you put stews or pottage or something like that in. You might have a kettle for water. And so you've basically got your fireplace with ev all the cooking stuff in it, all the stuff you need to live on. Um, and so in a, a house that only has one or two rooms, it works very effectively. So for people up to a certain level economically, it doesn't make sense that this is an international style of cookery. What doesn't make sense, it doesn't make sense for is when you get to areas of high prosperity with more rooms, do you need half cookery? They still did it that way in England. You have a hall on the upper story. You've got the, the cook, cook it, cookery and all the household area on the first. So the ground floor is it has got the half cookery and all the other stuff. And the level above is where the, the Lord's sleep has a hall. So you've got the hall and you've got the solar. And that's a, uh, not a major castle or anything. That's a, a small manor house and a really common way. And they still had open half cookery in England. But England is, and the south of France and the whole Mediterranean, they have a warmer climate. So there's some, some really interesting research that needs to be done. However, some open half cookery definitely happened in Poland, definitely happened in Germany because of the, 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 the peasant housing and the, the, the number of rooms push people towards it. And it's a cheap and effective way of cooking. So campfire cookery is our closest to it today. We don't, and it's a sophisticated set of, it's really sophisticated. It can be amazing cookery, um, but not very many people today can do it. And the people who have the most skills learn on open fires.
they can they can deal with open flats. A lot of utensils and accessories are international spoons, long forks for poking into things, which big bowls, lots of ceramic, lots of earthenware. So, so you can create a medieval foodway system that applies across Europe. And this is what we see in a lot of fantasy novels. You, you boil it down to basically the, the, com the things people have in common. And then you add potatoes and turkey. We have problems with young Mr. Martin. Do not add potatoes and turkey. I have been... Do not add potatoes and turkey. They were not known in the Middle Ages, either of them in Europe. Middle Ages in the Americas, and the Americas didn't have all the things that Europe had, so differentiate. So the Middle Ages food was a rich culture in terms of stuff, lots of possessions, made, horn spoons, antlers, um, wood, pottery, metal, all the stuff we have today that is non-electronic and non-mechanical, all the containers, all the jugs, all the bags there was lots of woven things they were as much addicted those of them who liked clutter had as much clutter as us those of them who didn't probably didn't but clutter was possible in the kitchen so we're not talking primitive cooking we are talking lots of exciting possibilities what we do in our play while we have this image of medieval food as being all we make simple classifications. It's much easier to run a role in game if you have a peasant and a noble and a bard and a lord. But society doesn't divide that way. Now, the other thing I could tell you about if you're interested is on food records, how you can find more yourself, what research is. Which it's a big subject, which is why I haven't gone into it. The, but what I'd like to do is... I, Open floor, that's such a technical term. Let people ask questions and let's talk about the food. All of this is the theory. But, but we're science fiction people. You want a lot of you want the fiction the, the theory so that you can, if you've been doing things in, in, in the world of the Witcher, you want the right food. Now, a lot of stuff with a lot of people because, yes, I'm a fandom person in helping find the right food for the right medievalish fantasy fantasy stories. So if you have favourite ones, this is when you say, what well, are things you've cooked and you want to know if they're appropriate or you want to know why I get so angry at lemon cakes in... I get angry at lemon cakes in Westeros. I get very angry at lemon cakes in Westeros. This is when we can talk about it. Or if you want to know about where you research, where, not where you actually research, why there's a truckload of stuff we don't know yet, let me give you one hint because we've got the, one of the pictures was for it. Um, there's a book called The Drizzle of Honey. And it's not medi medieval, it's a bit after. But the reason it's so important is the very clever historians used Inquisition records to rebuild a whole cuisine. You do not need recipe books. Recipe books are dead modern. The most, the earliest ones we have are from the 15th published, printed recipe books of 15th century. Um, there's a 1596 one there's a picture of in that series of, of pictures. The earliest actual recipe books are 12th century, except for a couple of ancient ones that there's a picture for them too. So you don't get food ways from recipe books for the Middle Ages. You get it from sermon literature, you get it from inquisition records, you get it from text records, you get it from rude comments and letters home. Now a lot about the use of pickle because of a letter Margaret Paston wrote her, her husband. And since most of those records have not been looked at for a lot of countries, there's a truckload of stuff that's still possible to know. In England, in France, a lot of the work's been done because they were, it's a, I don't know, a nation we thought. England has one of the great world 
cuisines for the Middle Ages, which is ironic given what people think of English food now. And that's why it's been studied so intensively. Um, France is France and the centre of the Middle Ages and everybody studies it. And that's why that one has other cuisines and haven't been studied and questions about what I've talked about or about your fantasy favourites. Please ask questions. Hi, Julian. Do you hear me? Yes, I can. Oh, hi, I I'm Veronica. Uh, I wanted to ask you maybe not about uh, recipes from Poland, but I wanted to ask you what is your favourite recipe from the book you mentioned earlier, this plain, you know which? I have two favourites. It's yeah. plain de long. I have two favourites. The first one is a, a recipe called Crespe, which I describe as um, the original medieval junk food. It's <laughs> little, little pancakes deep fried, then sprinkled with sugar, and they're crisp. That's why it's called Crespe. Okay. And the other, one, and the other one is pomace mai. So, so that's um, an apple dessert with uh -huh. which is all apple and almond milk and uh, and slivered almonds. And that sounds been, actually pretty good, but th there are, those are both desserts, right? No, one's junk food, the other is dessert. <laughs> okay, fair enough. Okay, uh, and I wanted to ask you also about this uh, Polish peasant uh, dish you showed us earlier, because I had a talk with my friends, yeah. and we have absolutely no idea what that is. Okay, I'm not going to try to pronounce it. But yeah, you, you can write some chat, actually, and I will tell you how to pronounce it. That's a good idea. Does it show me how? Does it let me write? No, it doesn't. It, yes, it does. So it is a perfectly normal thing. It just may not look like that these days. Uh huh. Kasha. Ah, of course. Yes, of course. It's. It's. Yeah, it's we, we, we didn't know. We didn't know what that is. I was thinking about Mama Wiga from Balkans, uh, which no. is on on corn flour, I think. Quite similar. Yes. So there are there are recipes that use grains. The one the great thing about the millet kasha is it's it's gluten free, mm -hmm. which means it's very handy for for groups of people and it's really yummy. So it's you boil your millet, you uh, drain it. Yeah. Millet. Let me type it for you because yes, I know what it is, but it's a grain and it's a grain very common in medieval Poland. It was the it and rye were the basic peasant grains. Okay, I will check it out for sure. Thank you. And you, you, you boil it you, with salt and water, you drain it, then you fry it in butter. That's all. Okay, that sounds quite easy, even for me, because, uh, you know, I, I love food. That's why I went to your, to your uh, talk. But I can fuck up almost everything in the kitchen. But maybe I will be able to do millet. The frying is a bit harder because you've actually got to make it right. Mm -hmm. so I'm glad it, you're all sorting out. I'm, I'm glad you're all sorting out what I, 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 because I, yeah, I only know it from from English language. So it's this, so so so. Okay. Any other questions or thoughts? Uh, yeah. I, thank you very much. I will now pass on my voice to anybody thank else. You. I'm very happy to talk about fandoms and the food of fandoms because I think one of the things I love about being a historian and a science fiction person is that is that you can play with it, which is why I do the cooking. I used to do banquets and feasts for um, fans in Canberra. We got hotel chefs to do all the cooking, but I and my friends did the research. It was so much fun. Okay. Why were the le lemon cakes in Western are so bad? Iron ovens were not a part. So lemon cakes require two things, two things, not just one. Um, they require, first of all, they require certain leavening. So, so we use bicarbonate of soda or baking powder. And then modern types of leavening, they weren't around in the Middle Ages. Hartshorn salt, hartshorn salts were used but they have a really odd flavour, so they so you don't use them for light, frothy, beautiful, beautiful cakes that are all air. The other thing was 
that the only time that they need short, hot bursts of cooking, which means you can cook them when you fire the very moment you fired up that oven. But George Martin has them as the food that people can eat any time. If you cook your bread once a week, you can have lemon cakes for the first two hours after that. And then you can't, or you, you make them and they're stale, and you have stale lemon cakes. But the lemon cakes in Game of Thrones are never stale. They're always fresh and straight out, which means they have to have come from iron ovens. And the technology for Westeros is actually mostly 17th century which 17th century but without guns which which is a problem for iron ovens you can't have the stoves any books that do their cuisines right this is a problem my because i'd be very embarrassed if they didn't um Yes, more books are getting it right because a lot more writers are talking to historians. George talks to historians and then doesn't get it right because it's a, there's a trick in writing medieval fantasy which is actually destructive to the history. You go for something that gets the feel for fant the fantastical feel, right? Like the richness of furs or, or the joy of flying through the air. And if you get that right, then you will accept the world as it is in the novel. And so you don't have to get the food right. It's historical fiction that works really hard on getting things authentic or as authentic possible as possible historically because their readers will throw the book at the wall if there's anything that's too inaccurate. Having said that, I was part of a group called the Unholy Trinity by Sharon Penman because we found that she had the wrong colour of squirrel in one of her most famous novels. So there are difficult readers, picky readers, for historical fiction because part of the lure of historical fiction is getting the history so it feels right. The lure of fantasy is that magnificence, isn't it? It's getting a world that feels rich and special. And so I never think about whether, except for specific cases like that lemon cake, which drive me crazy. Overall, I don't tend to think about whether the food is right or wrong. I think whether it's right for that world. Is, that, is it credible? Is it believable within that? Does that make sense? And that's why I can't give you an instant answer to it. Because with fantasy, I mostly don't judge right or wrong. However, there are a whole group of authors who are like me and who are very careful with research. And the easiest way to find them is to find out who hangs out together and talks about food. There are three dozen of us and we hang out together online so just watch our chats and see who talks about food um george doesn't get a lot right from in the middle ages because he basically gets it for the 17th century but he doesn't get a lot right because that's not why his book if you in the first book of game of thrones there is a moment when i I just want to tear my hair out because the carriage that Cersei is in can't go through the gate when she goes up north really early on. But it's, she's gone along all the roads that lead to the gate. Why is the gate suddenly narrower than the roads? It's because George is doing, does this, this, this magnificent moment where you feel the pain of the ego of the big coach. And it doesn't have much to do with actual practical stuff. He's not the only one. He's just the one I can talk about. And it's not a problem with his history. It's the nature of his world. 
the the witcher thing is the same it's the nature of the world it is part of good fantasy writing of that kind. so i can judge the food or i can i can be really unhappy about the lemon cake and about the lack of rule of law or other things um but the bottom line is it's still right for what it's doing as a fantasy novel which is why you got so much general stuff in the food explanation. Any other thoughts, questions? I'm getting very ranty, so obviously a good time. I need to let you know the battery is running low. So if I cut out, that would be why. And there's no PowerPoint nearby. I hope it will last a bit longer. I'm watching for questions or for thoughts. Offer. I hate you, Julian. I don't get that very often. That would be fun. Uh, so I can have potatoes in which I was interpret. I didn't know it was from the future because all I've done is seen the the films and read one of the books. I wasn't thinking about where it was, um, but it's tricky in another way because it may be in the future, but when you look at the TV series, the way it's set up is very much with a fantasy Central Europe background. It's still appealing to the same audience as Game of Thrones. And, and it's very clever that way. It's just really clever. Yeah, okay. I, I, I've actually done a lot of testing of road food because it is an issue. It's a big issue. Um, you can't have stews on the road. Diana Wynne-Jones was 100% right. What people had on the road was lots of cooking time that you factor that into your travelling. And there were things that you can carry, flour, for example, to make journey cakes. Johnny cake, the word in American English is journey cake that, that you because you go journey cakes meats dried meats not fresh meats and and the other thing is from the 17th century there were travel travel out of the sight of land you had soup so what became eventually instant soup and and ask me on twitter or facebook and i'll teach you how to make those because i make them That's so, so, so you're looking at food that can be cooked with just water. And so a lot of flour base, it was not healthy cooking unless you managed to scavenge or buy something. And if you have someone running for their life, they better have food that they're carrying. So there was a lot of buying. There were a lot of travel stops. Most people, when you have roads, could not travel more than 24 kilometres a day, 25 kilometres a day, and that's on a good road with horses. That's It's 20 miles outside Australia. In Australia is a day's journey on, on in colonial times, in other words, a century ago. And I checked, and it's 15 to 20 miles in, in Europe. After that, you've got taverns, you've got places you can go to get food, and they would sell food to take on the road. So a lot of people um, travelled with help and short bursts. Does that make sense? And bread, lots of bread. Oh, I was just remembered, pilgrims, medieval pilgrims often had bread in their, their pilgrim pouch which are basically messenger satchels. So bread, carrying bread or carrying flour is a good one. Anything else? Before my battery runs out. It's given me the warning, but it hasn't died yet. We've gone through two thirds of the battery. Uh, I, have, I have one another question. Yes. Uh, because we're talking so much about food and I'm thinking what to drink to accompany it. For example, okay. to, 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 you know, to uh, join with the question from before, what do we drink on our RPG sessions when we're on the road? 
when you're on the road, you're going to be de big myth about the Middle Ages was that people didn't drink water. People drank water. There was a town in France where a family was called Quinon Bebet Lacroix, who don't drink water because they were famous wine drinkers, that family. People drank water. So water is your most common thing. However, you would watch to see if the water was safe. How you tell.